Hey guys, Mr. Cheeves here. In this tutorial, we are going to look at the dynamic painting abilities that Blender provides to get some really cool effects. I've set up a basic blend file here with a plane and an icosphere. Let's get started by going to the plane's physics settings and enabling dynamic paint. Dynamic paint works with two different types of objects, a brush and a canvas. The canvas is what we paint onto and the brush obviously will affect it. On the plane, let's hit this button to give us a new canvas. That gives us all of the settings that we can tweak for this. A cool thing about dynamic paint is that you can add multiple canvases and brushes to a single object, much like you would add multiple particle systems or materials. Now under those different canvases, we have a format, an anti-aliasing checkbox, frame start and end values, and a substeps value. The format can be changed between vertex and image sequence, so you can either have it directly affect the object's vertex data, or you can have the dynamic paint be used as an image texture. If I switch this to image sequence, we get one more slider to control the resolution of the generated image. Anti-aliasing can be turned on to smooth out the paint, and those frame start and end values should be pretty self-explanatory. The substeps value determines how many times the paint is calculated between frames in the timeline. This is especially helpful for fast moving brushes, as only calculating the paint on the frame markers could lead to a skipping effect. Let's open up the surface dropdown under that. This is where the main canvas settings are going to be. I'm going to select the icosphere and create a brush so that I can demonstrate the settings under the surface dropdown. Also, because I am using the vertex format rather than an image sequence, I will need to subdivide this plane a couple times, giving us some vertices for the dynamic paint to affect. Blender gives us four different surface types to use, paint, displace, weight, and waves. Paint is the most basic one, allowing us to paint a color onto a vertex with our brush. To see this, we need to go to the shading options in the top right of our viewport, and change the color to vertex. We also need to go to this output menu and select a place for the color information to be stored. We only need a paint map for now. We'll talk about our wet maps later. I'll use this field right here to select a vertex color layer to output color onto, or use this plus button to add one if there isn't a vertex color layer there already. Now that we've done that, we can start playing the animation. I can move the psychosphere around in real time and it will paint onto the vertices of our plane. There are three standard settings that exist no matter what surface type you are using on your canvas, and those are the brush collection, the scale influence, and the radius. The brush collection field allows you to define what specific collection the brush is in, so you could have multiple dynamic paint objects and not have them affect each other. Scale Influence controls the strength brushes have on the canvas between the values of 0 and 1. Radius controls the scale of the brush when using proximity or particle-based brushes, which we will take a look at later. There is one more setting that is used for most of the surface types, and that is Dissolve. This is used to let the canvas return to its original state after the brush has affected it. The time value is the number of frames that it remains affected before the effect dissolves, and the slow button will make the dissolve more gradual. Now that we've gone over those basic settings, let's look at the ones that are specific to each surface type. The first one we're going to look at is paint. The first of these settings that we're going to take a look at is dry. When you're painting, a wet map will be generated alongside the color, which is just a grayscale map to store how wet the surface is at any given point. The dry setting allows the paint to dry after a certain period of time, the length of which is defined by the time value. The color value affects what level of dryness the color of the paint will shift, but I usually don't have to mess with that. We're going to skip over the cache dropdown for now and open up this effects area. These settings and the one under it, initial color, are specific to the paint surface type as the ones before, 
and won't appear on any of the other surface types. Enabling spread will let the paint fill in vertices next to it after the brush has laid down the initial paint. If I toggle that on, you can see the paint spreading out. We have two values here. One speed controls how fast the paint spreads, and color controls how fast colors mix together if you have multiple colors of spreading paint. The drip settings will let the paint drip down a surface while being affected by things like gravity and force objects. Velocity and acceleration define how much those two things affect how the paint drips down a surface. Under that, we have the weight section, where you can define where the force objects to affect the dripping are, and how much each different type of force object will affect your dripping paint. The next setting, Shrink, will pinch the paint's wetness together as it dries. You won't be able to see much on the base color map, maybe a little bit of an effect on the edges of the paint if you have the shrinking speed set really high. If we take a look at the wet map though, the tail of the paint will pinch together as it dries. Under those three settings we have initial color, if you want the object to have a base color before the brush starts painting on it. You can set this as an image texture, a vertex color layer, or a flat basic color. By the way, if you want to find these different vertex color layers, those are located under this triangle tab in the context menu. And right under that we have an output, where we can once again select a vertex color layer to output our paint map, and a different one to output our wet map. If we switch our canvas format to an image sequence up here, this little area will be replaced by a file path for an image sequence cache as well as a field where you can select a UV map for the images to be drawn from, a file type choice between PNG and OpenEXR, and an option to multiply the color by the alpha, or transparency, of the image. Now that we've gone over paint, let's look at the second surface type. Displace is a lot simpler than paint, quite luckily. If I play our animation and move this icosphere around, the plane will be displaced by the sphere. We have three settings we can change for this displacement. Maximum Displace, Displace Factor, and the Incremental Toggle. The Max Displace sets a limit on how far the mesh can be moved, and is disabled if the value is set to zero. The Displace Factor controls the strength of the displacement, so you can make the displacement super strong without needing a large brush. And lastly, toggling the incremental setting on will make the displacement layer and stack on top of itself, as seen here. Something to note with the displacement is that we are not given an option for output, as anything we do here will be directly kept in the mesh when we bake it under the cache dropdown. The weight surface type allows you to paint weights onto the vertices of the mesh, and as such is not available when using the image texture format for the canvas. Weight mode doesn't give us any extra settings. Down under the output dropdown, we can select a vertex group for the weights to be output to. Weighting your vertices with dynamic paint can be really cool and useful, especially for things like hair or particles that can use vertex groups for density. And the last type of surface, waves, is quite probably the coolest thing ever. Let's just play this animation and watch for a bit. The first setting we are given, Open Borders, will remove the collision that the waves get when hitting the edge of the plane. These two next settings might be a little confusing as they both deal with the speed of the simulation. The Blender documentation, however, will describe how they are different. Time scale will change the run speed of the simulation without influencing the outcome, while speed directly changes how fast the waves travel on the surface. I personally haven't seen too much of a difference between the two, but they are present regardless. I describe damping as changing the intensity of the waves. If I set it to zero, the waves won't be calmed at all as the simulation progresses, leaving this strange behavior in the corners. 
If I set the damping to 1, all movement will be removed from the waves. Spring is the strength with which the water gets pulled back to its original state. So if I set this to 1, the water stays relatively flat and equalizes quickly. If I set it to 0, the water gets more verticality. Smoothness does exactly what you think it would, smoothing out the waves. This can remove some of the sharper creases you may get, but will come at the cost of lost detail. Let's now hop back to the Icosphere to take a look at the settings for our brush. The three most basic ones are the paint color, the alpha, and the wetness. Paint color is obviously going to be the color that the brush paints onto the canvas. Alpha controls the transparency of the brush. Something to note is that this transparency only affects the brush color or weights, and not how much it displaces a canvas in displace or wave mode. Wetness is just how wet the brush is to start with. If absolute alpha is toggled on, then the transparency only takes effect if the brush has less transparency than the surface it is drawing on. This essentially makes it so that the brush cannot increase the transparency, it can only increase how opaque the canvas will be. Erase paint, the last of these basic settings, just makes the brush function as an eraser. The brush settings also give us five different sources that we can generate our paint from. We are going to go up this list from the bottom to the top. Mesh volume is the most basic one, painting directly from the space that the object takes up. This source option gives us no additional settings. Mesh volume plus proximity will paint from the volume of the mesh, as well as its proximity or distance to the canvas. We can define the distance that it starts painting from with this distance value. We are given three different ways to define the falloff, or the way the brush interacts with the canvas the further it gets away. A smooth falloff will give us a nice gradient as the brush gets more distant, making the draw size smaller and the strength less noticeable. The constant falloff will give us hard edges and no decreased strength as the brush gets further away. And the color ramp falloff gives us a color ramp that we can add values to and customize as we wish. We are also given a few more settings under the falloff. Inner proximity will make the falloff be applied within the mesh rather than outside of it. Negate volume makes the volume of the mesh be ignored while painting. We can see this if I hide the icosphere at the beginning of the animation. Project will make the paint only be cast in a certain direction, defined by this ray direction setting right under it. We can get the paint only from the direction of the canvas normals, or the way its faces are pointing, to put it more simply. We can get the paint only from the normals of the brush as well, or we can get the paint direction only from the z-axis. The next type of brush painting is only proximity. This uses the same settings as we just went over, but removes the ones related to the volume of the mesh as that is not calculated in this mode. The object center mode will use proximity based paint as well, only from the object center though. Again we have a distance value and a falloff. The cool thing about this mode is that it doesn't use vertices for painting, as it's using the object's center. This means that we can use an object like an empty to paint rather than a mesh. The last type of brush source, particle system, is really cool. I'm going to add in an emitter particle system on the icosphere to visualize this. If I select that particle system under the brush settings and play the animation, we can see the paint appear where the particles pass through the plane. The first setting we are given, Effect Solid Radius, is the radius around the particle that will be painted solid. Checking Use Particles Radius will deactivate this value, and instead use the scale value under the render menu in the particle settings. This last setting for our particles, Smooth Radius, sets the amount of smoothing applied to these particles. We can see that if I set this to 1, the particles will be massive and soft, whereas if I set this to 0, the particles will be small and perfectly sharp. These velocity settings will apply to all brush types, no matter what you are using as your source. 
multiply alpha and multiply depth will multiply their respective attributes by this color ramp under this ramp dropdown. Replace color will replace the brush's paint color with the colors in this ramp. Max velocity will set a limit on how much velocity can be accrued for these toggles. This is calculated in blender units per frame. Smudge will change how the paint is drawn based on the velocity. This effect can be a little hard to notice, but it does exist. This last section in the brush settings, Waves, will only affect the simulation if the canvas surface type is set to Waves. There are four different ways our brush can affect the waves. The first type is Depth Change, the default. This will change the depth of a surface around the brush based on the factor value. Something cool is that a negative factor value can also be used, so we could easily get something like the wake of a boat by using a value of negative 1 or negative 2. The obstacle type will essentially make the surface collide with the object. It produces results similar to depth change. The force type will affect the velocity of the waves. This means that it won't create large waves like the depth change or obstacle types, but can still create movement if the brush is animated. And our fourth type, reflect only, will not create any waves. Rather, it will only reflect, or bounce back, waves that collide with it. Even when animated, this won't affect the surface, unless there are pre-existing waves for the brush to collide with. You can view the factor value as the strength of the effect. Unfortunately, this only goes between negative 1 and positive 1 when dragging along the value, and is restricted between negative 2 and 2 when typing values in. Clamp Waves is our last brush setting, and it will simply restrict the amount that the waves can be affected by the brush, and it is disabled if it has a value of 0. To demonstrate this, I'm going to make my ISCO sphere really large. You can see that by playing this, the simulation gets somewhat insane. We can enter a value into the clamp waves to restrict the movement and calm this down. A lower value is more restrictive, while a higher value allows more movement. Once you've done whatever you want to with a dynamic paint simulation, you can go to the canvas and press the bake button to cache and save the simulation. If you are using the image sequence format, you will also have to bake that out to files under the output dropdown. Hopefully you now know more about using dynamic paint inside of Blender. This was a more technical tutorial and we didn't really create a full animation, but I would still love to see anything you make with dynamic paint linked in the comments section below. I want to thank you all for watching and have a great day!